The Rye Historical Society acknowledges the indigenous peoples, the Munsi Lenape, Wappinger, and Shattuck, who are the original inhabitants of the lands now known as Rye, New York. We pay our respects to their tribal members past and present. Indigenous ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. This coastal region was their homeland. Indigenous peoples experienced genocide and displacement during the colonial era and beyond. Today, we celebrate their heritage and traditions. We honor their stewardship of this sacred land in the past, present, and future. We acknowledge today's Lenape communities, including Lenape people who belong to the Delaware Nation and Delaware Tribe of Indians in Oklahoma, the Stockbridge Muncie community in Wisconsin, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and Delaware of Six Nations in Ontario. We acknowledge the Skagacoke people of Connecticut. This is a living land acknowledgement, and we will continue to revise and strengthen it in collaboration with community members. Good morning, everyone. My name is Colleen Pettis, and I have the honor of serving Holy Child as the head of school. Welcome to our Witness Stones Project Installation Ceremony in partnership with the Rye Historical Society. At Holy Child, our student experiences are intentionally planned to further our mission of developing young women of conscience and action. This Witness Stone Project is a reflection of our mission in action. The project called on our students to restore the history and honor the humanity of the enslaved individuals who helped build our communities through inquiry-based learning and analytical research. This type of authentic learning is what makes a holy child education remarkable. Thank you to the Rye Historical Society for your partnership with our school and to the government leaders who have joined us today. I especially thank Ms. Kathleen Gladhar, our middle school social studies teacher, for her leadership and passion for this meaningful work. And of course, to our seventh and eighth grade students for their engagement and commitment. Your work will have a lasting impact on our school as well as on the Rye community. Please join in welcoming our middle school choir. My name is Sherry Jordan. I'm the former director of the Rye Historical Society, and I would like to <clears throat> thank the Historical Society for including me in this uh, ceremony. This was a project that um, I was extremely excited and happy to bring to Rye and to see it coalesce and, and work out. A uh, few brief words on, on how this all got started, because for me, it got started back in 2015 when Pam McGuire who was researching uh, for her master's thesis, because after you've retired, what do you do but you go back and get your master's in museum <laughs> studies. Um, and we came across a bill of sale for one Margaret Peg Lyons, an enslaved woman, and we were, our hearts were blown. And so we started trying to publicize this, and that brought me to Teresa Vega, my twin, my twin with the pink. Um, <laughs> Teresa, besides being a living descendant of Pegline's family, along with Pat Bryany, who is sitting with her, her cousin from the green side, I started my long, in, uh, I would say, apprenticeship, being guided by my mentor and friend, Teresa, on what the enslaved experience was like in the New England and uh, Mid-Atlantic area. 
Um, as we learned this, uh, what we really wanted to do was tell the stories of the people involved. And we've discovered, uh, through Teresa, I found out about Dennis Culleton's Witness Stones Project. And all we needed, the missing piece that we needed, was a school that was willing to work with us. And I cannot tell you how delighted I am that Holy Child stepped forward and we worked on this project. It is the most incredible experience because this is what we want. We want all of our young scholars to do the research and to tell those stories for us. So thank you very much for stepping up and leading this program. And I hope that this will be just one of many, many more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam McGuire, and I apologize for bringing my dog, but he kind of goes everywhere with me. I just want to speak briefly to the students who are here because I want to share the experience that I had, and it's my hope that every student will have the same experience. So yes, I was doing a master's degree after retiring from a 30-some-odd career year career as a lawyer at PepsiCo, and I decided to, to do some research on um, the use of historical documents, original documents, to tell stories. And I was taking a class at the time on that very topic, so the idea was how to use original source documents, go right to the source, to get the story. And I was sitting in here, in this very building, and I was going through the oldest records that we have from the 17, really the oldest ones, 1600s, but mostly from the 1700s. And I came across the will of Ezekiel Halstead. And he lived in this house, for many, his family lived in this house for many, many years. And in his will, he explicitly stated that he was giving his slaves upon his death to his wife. And that was the first thing that I saw. And I, I honestly had, I sort of knew that there had been slaves here, but I had never seen anything like that. And it was startling because, think about it, I was reading this about these slaves, and I was sitting in the very building where they were enslaved. And it was an amazing kind of emotional experience to realize that. So I read on and I came upon an inventory of his estate when he died in 1800. And there were two slaves, there were three slaves listed by name. One was Hannah, who I think was um, sort of an indentured servant that he had rented. One was Jack and one was Rose. And he named them by name, it was, they were named by name in the inventory of the property that he owned when he died, and there was a value given for that property. So imagine, in a will, the list of the names of two people with a value, a dollar value, or at that time, probably still British pound value, placed on them. And I just, I found that such a startling and, um, vivid example of bringing history to life and it it really had a huge impact on me as a researcher and and probably more importantly as a person so i hope that each of you as students will have that opportunity and if you get that opportunity to work with these original documents written at the time period that you are researching take it because it will make it come alive in ways that, that perhaps you can never imagine. So thank you to Sherry for inspiring me. Thank you for Teresa for inspiring me and for giving me the, the gift of knowledge and um, hopefully the gift of understanding. I want to say that this is my favorite part of the Witness Stones Project, and I'm so happy to be here. For hundreds of years, my ancestors have lived in the tri-state area, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. Our green line traces back to the Byron section of Greenwich, which used to be Saw Pits, then was East Porchester, and then was Rye. 
and I want to encourage the young students here today is to look broader than contemporary borders. This area that is dry was part of a much larger landmass. I can trace our ancestors back to the 1700s to Rye. My fourth great grandfather lived in this area. His brother, Jack Green, was a black patriot, fought in both Connecticut and in New York. Right next door to Jack in 1800, 1810 is a Jacob Green, there was a James Green. My own third great grandfather, Alan Green, he lived in Rye in 1830 before moving to Round Hill Road in Greenwich and building the Green Schwachman House. So for two decades now, I've been searching for my people, and I'm still searching for the Greens who lived in this area. For over 20 years, um, I've researched my ancestors who were enslaved, who uh, took the first steps to freedom. As a local and family historian, I can tell you that the work we do is tedious, it's hard, it's frustrating um, work. The reality is that we find breadcrumbs about the lives of the enslaved in libraries, different archives, newspapers. Some of us keep reaching and, and, and for the hope, and we keep researching because we are historical detectives who know that there may be some golden nuggets, some breadcrumbs that we can follow that are buried in historical archives like this one here today. We hope and pray that some breadcrumbs will lead to others. I want to thank my colleagues at the Rye Historical Society, especially my bestie over there, <laughs> Sherry Jordan, uh, Pam McGuire, Allison, Debbie, Jake, and the rest of the staff here. I'm also very grateful and thankful that my friend Dennis, Dennis Culliton began the Witness Stones Project. It's a wonderful project that I stand behind 100%. This project is devoted to documenting true American history from the perspective of individual case studies of enslaved people and engaging young students in historical research. True American history should be learned from all perspectives. Only then can we get a clearer picture of how this country came to be. Every person who has lived has a story to tell. One story isn't better than another. They're just different stories from different perspectives. To the students and teachers here today from Holy Child, I want to express my sincere gratitude on behalf of all the descendants of enslaved people in Rye and from Rye. We thank you for the time and effort you spent researching our ancestors. You're truly heroes to us. Um, and your efforts are contributing to the local history of Rye, to Westchester County, as well as the state of New York. There are more stories buried in libraries and archives. I hope your participation in this project will stimulate a desire to learn more, not only about the lives of enslaved people here in Rye, but also about your own individual ancestors. They have stories too. I also want you to know that the research you have done will, without a doubt, lead descendants of Rose and Jack to reclaim them as their own. There are so many descendants who are still around who don't know about Rose and Jack or their history. And thanks to your good work, maybe they will. Over the past four years, I found a few golden nuggets on my own, one of which gave me a paper trail that led to dis the discovery late last year that I descend from not only the original Munzee Lenape who occupied this land, but also from Manuel de Gerrit de Reis, one of the original 11 Angolans who arrived in Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, in 1626. In June, I'm bragging now, my first peer-reviewed article will be published that will detail the three critical documents I found. And this is after two decades of research. And those three, yeah, that's a that's a, that's a golden nugget there. That's a golden nugget. So I challenge you in closing, 
to keep following the trail of breadcrumbs you've found so far, as they may very well lead you to some more golden nuggets, not only in the lives of Rose and Jack, but also maybe in the lives of your own ancestors. And remember, everybody who lived has a story. So there's so many more stories for you guys to find. And you're young, you have the rest of your life. If Pam here can retire and still be concerned, I have so much hope for you. God bless, thank you. Hi, I'm Dennis Colleton from the Witness Stones Project, and I'm so happy to see all of you here today. Uh, we started this project six years ago in the town of Guilford when I was a middle school teacher. And I had done a lot of research on my own about uh, enslaved people in the community I was in. Uh, the town we lived in uh, does a great job of bragging on uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's mother and father lived there, of um, the uh, Harriet living there after her mother died. Harriet wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and you might be looking at that when you get to high school. But, um, but we didn't remember the time before, the generation before, where people in the community, including Harriet's family, uh, held people in captivity. So after collecting the documentation, I couldn't figure out how to bring it to the classroom. And a friend of mine went to Germany and came back and said, could we remember enslaved people the way Germans remember Jews who were kidnapped and murdered during the Holocaust? In Central Europe, there are about 70,000 Stropelstein that are placed there to remember um, Jews who, uh, who died during World War II. And as soon as he said that, it, it, it came to my mind is instead of trying to tell the story of the thousands of enslaved people in the North, instead of trying to tell the stories of hundreds of enslaved people in a community, what if we told the story of one person? What if we told the story of a person who lived there where they live, uh, in a house or an uh, area where they, they go by every day, and to try to imagine that person's life? And, and from that, um, the, the project took off. And it really spreads because we have educators and, uh, and administrators and curriculum folks uh, who say, let's do this. It, it works because there are Pam McGuire's out there and Teresa Vegas who have already gave us a running head start, give us the materials that we can use. And, and certainly uh, we, we, we use a lot of your documentation. And, and Teresa has now become a great uh, advisor and confidant of the project because she her image of or understanding is uh, surpasses, I think, everybody here. Um, and, you know, we're, we were excited when, when, when Sherry invited us. And, uh, and that happened because of what happened in Greenwich. And that happened because of what happened. Um, I might, uh, a board member, uh, Grace Zimmer, was, was working at a house museum in Guilford. And, and the docent at that house museum now is in Greenwich. And she's the one who helped bring it there. So it spreads through um, diffusion. It spreads from one voice to another, one person to another. Um, but it also helps us understand the past. I, I was recently in a community in rural Connecticut and a member of the Historical Society said, well, you're not trying to rewrite history, are you? And I, and I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're not trying to say that slavery was wrong back in the colonial time. I said, no, I'm not trying to say it. I am saying it. I, I'm saying slavery was wrong. I, I think there's this guy named Moses. I remember Moses, he didn't think slavery was a good deal. Um, I, I think that people who fought the American Revolution, they used the metaphor of breaking the chains of slavery from the British. They didn't think slavery was a good deal. So who was, who was slavery right for? It was right for the enslaver because they were benefiting from it. It was never right for the other, for the person being enslaved. So we had to break that myth. We have to, when people stand up and say, it was okay then. It was never okay. And all you have to do is go back and read the Bible or go back and read the <clears throat> treatises about the American Revolution to understand that. That slavery was never right. And so we have to look at our past and look at it with a new set of eyes to realize wrong can be wrong. There are universal wrongs and rights, and, and slavery was one of them. And, and I, the reason I bring that up is because we, I just continually have that conversation. But you all are telling the story of, of not enslaved victims, but of individuals, of humans, of people who had humanities, people, individuals who had agency, individuals who had resistance. You're telling the peop you're telling the story of, of, of us. You're telling the, the story of, of humans and humanity. And, and it's very powerful for me. I want, well, you know, I do miss teaching. I teach teachers now instead of students, but I, I'm, I'm so excited that you had this opportunity. And thank you, Sherry and Rye Historical Society and the Holy Name, <coughs> I'm sorry, Holy Child School, 
uh, uh, to uh, bring us here and to spread the word uh, about our project and the people like Jack and Rose who were held here in captivity. Thank you. Hello, I am Rachel Estroff. I'm here on behalf of Senator Shelley Mayer. Um, she's the state senator representing this area, and she's also the chair of the New York State Education Committee, uh, Senate Education Committee. She's very sorry that she couldn't be here today. Not, you know, she, she likes to go to many events in her community, but this is particularly powerful for her. So I, I thank you for having me here on her behalf. Um, in restoring the humanity of the enslaved, you're pressing all of us to face, truly face our history and in ways in which our communities and all of us prospered and were built upon slavery. And that is incredibly powerful. It's also, you know, as we identify that, we also identify opportunities to humanize people in our everyday lives, um, in our daily interactions, to see who is marginalized in our communities and who we distance ourselves from whether it's the poor or immigrants or it's people who are simply different from us. And I, I, just the power of humanizing people is really something that I think uh, cannot be, you know, it can, the value of that cannot be overstated. So thank you for having me. Thank you for this work. And uh, Senator Mayer, again, is sorry that she couldn't be here. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Rivera, and I'm here on behalf of Assemblymember Chris Burdick. Um, I want to thank you so much for having me here. Um, when I read about the Witness Stones Project and its mission to restore the history and to honor the humanity of the enslaved individuals in this community, I was really inspired at the fact that 7th and 8th graders were doing this project. Because we have to remember that slavery has existed for 246 years, which is much longer than it's been abolished. And particularly, we think about slavery being something that only the southern states participated in. But in fact, New York State was the second to last state in the northern states to abolish slavery. So with that, with that in mind, and although we can't undo our past, we can change how we move forward, which is exactly how I see this project, the Witness Owns Project, to be able to honor the enslaved individuals of this community and to also move forward to acknowledge our wrongs and to move forward to continue working against, against racism and inequality in our communities. So thank you so much for having me here today. and. The assembly member absolutely loves coming to these things. He's held up in Albany with a bunch of budget stuff, and we all know that. We know we want the budget to pass soon in New York, but I am so grateful to have the opportunity to be here for you today. So thank you. Yes, good morning. I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said, but uh, my name's Lisa Urban, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Assemblyman Steve Otis, who was also in Albany. And let me tell you, he would much rather be here today than up there discussing uh, the budget. So, and he, he loves speaking before before uh, school groups. So, um, I just have a brief statement. But again, thank you for Mrs. Gladhar and the Holy Family, Holy Child Family, and to the Rye Historical Society for hosting this event today. Congratulations to the entire Holy Ch Child community for undertaking the Witness Stones Project. You are learning about the local history of slavery and honoring those, and today it's Rose and Jack, who suffered under the oppression. The best way to understand our history is to make sure our history tells the full story of America. History should pass along the good values and our values our country aspires to and to the times where our nation fell terribly short. What is exceptional about Holy Child's commitment to the Witness Stones Project is that it comes at a time when states and school districts are prohibiting the teaching of this history and banning books that tell the story of slavery in this country. It is amazing that in America of 2023 that such censorship exists, but in reality it does. So congratulations to all of you for studying the accurate telling of American history. I am confident you know the importance of the lessons learned and at this time appreciate the importance of the decision by your school to offer the accurate sharing of our history and the larger lesson that truth is always something we should value. Thank you very much again for uh, inviting me on behalf of Steve Otis.
I, I hadn't noticed the little griffin left here. Thank you. It's very cheering. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to see all of you. But part of the pleasure that I take in being here today is the pleasure of experiencing something that I've been experiencing for some years now, which is, I'll characterize as a waning blindness about who lived here and who worked here and who made the town of Rye the town that it is. And it's very easy for us to think in terms of names like Halstead and Gedney and Purdy. We have street names for those people. And we have cemeteries like the cemetery across the street that teach us a lesson about a certain kind of people who were here. And we have a tendency, and please forgive my tremor, it's there all the time. Um, we have a tendency to think in those terms, or at least I have had that tendency. And a project like the Witness Stones Project and the work of Holy Child and the work of the Rye Historical Society is something that I'm tremendously grateful for as I understand who we were and who we are now as a truly diverse people drawing strength from that diversity. We have a tendency, or at least I do, at living just, just down the road um, by what was called Milltown, to think in terms of movie pictures of the people who lived here and how it came to be. And that's always people who came here for more religious freedom or for more economic freedom. And yet here we are today remembering people who were brought here not for freedom, but actually for the opposite and kept here unfree and against their will. And that's so important. It's so important that we include those people in our picture of this town and really the picture of who we are, how we got here, and who we want to be. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Bill. I'm changing the program a little. I'm State Senator Shelley Mayer. I did get here. I got here because this is so important. So important to us. And I'm so appreciative to Holy Child and the Rye Historical Society. But to you students, to you girls that are standing here, the fact that we are talking about two individual people, Rose and Jack, two people, not two ideas, but two individual people, is such a powerful reminder and I would just uh, encourage you to all look at the sculpture of Vinnie Bagwell from Yonkers, who does sculptures of enslaved people and their story. And it brings you back to remembering, we're not talking about an idea, as bad as it may be. We are talking about human beings, people like you. They had mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. And so the humanizing of these individuals is so important and powerful. And I'm so thankful for the Witness Stones Project. I just would point out, stones are used in many places to give memory and recognition to individuals. So you're building on a very powerful tradition. And I'm glad I could be here, and I want to thank you students. I hope you understand. Put yourself in the shoes of these individuals we're talking about, because that is what humanizing history and remembering our past is all about. Thank you for having me. American slavery is often believed to be the southern system that allowed enslavers to view and treat the people they enslaved as property. However, this assumption is incorrect. In reality, slavery in the United States was a system that caused the enslaved in both the North and South to be treated inhumanely. 
Through Falls, he had frequent teachings about what Northern slavery was like. The stories of those enslaved in the North have almost been erased from history. That, however, is about to change. Recently, a Connecticut-based historical group has been working to uncover the hidden horrors enslaved people in the North faced. The Witness Stones Project is an educational initiative whose mission is to restore the history and honor the humanity of the enslaved individuals who helped build our communities. The project provides resources for students to learn about the history of slavery in their town and its modern day impact. Once the research is complete, a Witness Stone Memorial is placed in their community. The memorial recognizes an enslaved person who lived in their town and is put in a place where they may have lived, worked, or worshipped. In Rye, New York, 7th and 8th grade students from the School of the Holy Child have been preparing to place a Witness Stone Memorial at the Nath House. Their Witness Stone will honor Rose, a woman enslaved in Rye until she was 36. Rose was born sometime in the year 1773 and was enslaved by Ezekiel Halstead Sr. and later by Philemon Halstead, Ezekiel's son. Unlike the South, it is likely Rose lived with other enslaved people in an attic or a small space close to the Halstead's home. If given one, her education would have been purely religious. On June 5, 1808, Rose married Jack, a free black man. Almost one year later, Rose was finally granted her freedom. Today, extensive records on all the Halstead family can be found through a quick Google search. Rose's story and those of countless other black people, however, are incomplete and based on theories, not facts. When left unacknowledged, the sins of the past are more likely to be repeated. As the lives of those in the past shape the present, it is critically important these enslaved people's stories be preserved and remembered. Through organizations like the Witness Stone Project, the true story of slavery in the North can be taught and addressed. Rose, Rose was born in 1773 in Rye, New York, and was one of many at the time who was born into the slavery system of Westchester County. At the time, slavery was seen as something that was relatively normal, heavily relied on, and was seen as a basic living standard. Even people who were not directly involved with the slave trade benefited from the effects of slavery. Around 12.5% of New York's population were enslaved, and almost every household in Rye had at least one person who was enslaved in doing labor. Rose was one of these people. At this, at this point in time, many people who should have been, many places that should have been safe were not speaking up about slavery. In fact, many were pro-slavery and supported it. An example of this were churches at the time. Many churches were not speaking up about the horrors of slavery and did not make an effort to stop it. Although this was quite common at the time, there were also churches that didn't support slavery and actively spoke against it. One of these churches was the Rye Methodist Church. The Rye Methodist Church was founded in 1771 and, is lo and was located in Rye, New York. At the time, it was one of the many, very few churches that was particularly anti-slavery anti and vocally against it. The Rye Methodist Church used its teachings preach against slavery and educate people as to why slavery is not something that should be glorified. This church also was somewhere where people who were enslaved or had been freed could go to take, place, take part in religious practices, get married, and be part of a community where the color of their skin was not what made them a person. Rose was one of these people who got married in the Rye Methodist Church. Rose was originally enslaved by Ezekiel Halstead Sr., but was willed and continued to be enslaved by Philemon Halstead in 1800 when Ezekiel died, along with her son, Jack. Rose married a man named Jack in the Rye Methodist Church in 1808, still while she was enslaved by Philemon Halstead. Marrying Jack was believed to be a choice she made herself, rather than it being someone choosing how she should live her life. A year later, at age 36, Rose and several others who were enslaved under Philemon Halstead were freed from their enslavement, and the Rye Methodist Church was a safe place that they could all go because despite the color of their skin, the church valued them as a person. After being freed, we do not know too much about what happens to Rose similarly to many people living in her time. She wasn't valued as a person and altogether was not seen. Since then, we as a community have been making, have been making an effort to make sure that the lives of people like Rose are not forgotten. I want to make sure that these people who are a part of the town of Rye's history are not forgotten and that they are honored, remembered, and recognized as the warriors they are. Every family, big or small, had a slave in New York. Day in and out, they did work. How they got there, you may wonder, most likely through the Atlantic slave trade, which 
across Africa to be funded. From Africa to the Americas, filled with people young and old, the raw material from forced labor taken care of to be sold. 1773 marked the era of life changing hours. Growth sprouted, shackled from a cheek with many thorns. To a halt that her life was planned, a man, Ezekiel by name, he worked hard for his own gain. To him, it was normal. Deep down, she knew she had freedom. Religious education was given to her from the family. Her life now changes again. A man joins her and Jack June 5th of the day. These things unknown, her life somehow erased. 1809, a different kind of story in Rosa's life. A Halstead named Philemon who gave her back her life. Freedom for her granted how sad for her son the separation, but the triumph from the life she leaves, life transitions. She is not the first nor the last. But with this stone, we hope to mend the past. Her life forgot records of days on the ground for slaves and color, although their names should be pronounced. For the bravery and fight put up, for the persistence and endurance, for most times a matter of sickness. For the prayers of change and those who came after, for the fighters we know who changed the matter. So on this day, we commemorate Rose, yes, but we address the mindset. The mindset of the wrong and wrong, the one who prolonged the act. We stand here today not only for the downtrodden, but also for those whose lives and sacrifices are still for them. Imagine having a life to live, but nothing to live for. Imagine spending every day of your young years at the Halstead Farm. Imagine only dreaming in your dreams and not seeing your wishes come true. Imagine being born into a life where you cannot see beyond the clouds. Imagine living a life without any fear or pain. Imagine growing up to become a woman and not stay a girl. I can't imagine my own backyard where humans lay in throbbing discomfort. Once we're children screaming in agony, now screaming at joy for the, for the fun of the ride at Playland. I was born to be free, so why should I imagine to live my life with strife? Well, I discovered I should when I heard about Rose's life, a beautiful girl with a long journey, an inspiration to work for a change. She's stuck and she's there. She's barely thriving, but she's there. Her day is filled with blood, sweat, and tears, knowing she has a broken heart to repair. Her happiness is so quickly like water on a dry sponge, yet maybe someone could change her mind from black to gray. One new wench. Well, her confidence is probably away. She's trapped in a never ending loop of unjust actions. She should probably just run away. Will she risk it for satisfaction? Nope, just to be caught the next day. She works faster than a rocket, but her work somehow becomes unnoticed. While her enslavers get her profits, she continues to stay focused. Her scars tell stories of how she's tough as a rock, but does she feel that way? She's treated as the ugly sheep in a flock, yet wants to believe every word they say. Her family, one of the richest, they are the flower and she's the stem. Her luck must be the biggest, but does she realize she's not one of them? She's not on a field, but she's not in the nicest place. She still sleeps with the rats and mice. Look at the look on her face, she didn't have to pay this price. Yes. One guy down, more to go. Her thoughts as her slavery dies. She is free and no more fear to show. She was handed to another family. Well, isn't that a surprise? She's finally free after a law has passed. She finally has been in love. Her misery has ended at last. Was she forever free or forever stuck? I was listening to the first story of how the will was read of the Halstead, one of their many acts of kindness, particularly to the African American community, was to dedicate a piece of property here in the city of Rye, known as the African American Cemetery, which is not too far from where we are standing. It's on the site of Greenwood Union Cemetery. I am the fourth generation out of six from Port Chester. My great great aunts and uncles are buried in the African American Cemetery in which I am so grateful for the Halsteads because they're close. Born in 1864, not here in New York but in Virginia, their body now rests with three generations of my family members. So I am indeed grateful to that name, Halstead, of what they have done for my family. 
Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Brothers and sisters, listen to the words of the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who could destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Relief in the sufferings of indigenous people and those who have been enslaved. Lord, we ask you to give them peace of mind and renew the faith and protection of your care. Protect all of us from oppression and violence. Keep us safe from weapons of hate and restore dignity and peace to all mankind through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may the God of every good blessing bless the success of the work of those in the endeavors of the Witness Stone Project and all who would look upon these stones in honor of Rose and Jack. Amen. Amen. Amen.